And many of you will know that I've got a long-standing interest in the writing of biography, and an, I'm an avid reader of biographies and autobiographies. And one of the things that's said is that biographies are usually better if the biographer has some kind of affection for their subject. And what I want to say at the outset is that I do feel as though I definitely have an affection for Caroline. And to repeat the reasons why her story has resonance for me, one of the elements of that is that she very much, her campaign, her fight, very much speaks to me about family stories that I grew up with, family stories of lost opportunities because they barriers were in place so my mother, my grandmother in particular, they've not had access to a secondary education. The other reason it speaks so powerfully to me is because of my own experience of comprehensive education. And, and, and for me at the time, it, I actually, I mean I'm, I'm talking about the 1970s and it just felt as though that was the status quo, the norm, to, to then, I think it was doing A-level sociology actually that we first properly did about the 1944 Education Act, but the grammar school, that system, it really seemed very much distant history and it was only kind of relatively recently as I, you know, obviously as my um, own um, kind of scholarly journey I suppose developed that you, and you start looking at the statistics, you realise actually how the proportions of children, young 11 year olds going to comprehensive, you know, it wasn't the norm when I went to a comprehensive school. But it felt like this was, this was modernity. So one of my themes actually is around the notion of modernity and progress. And that's partly triggered by a chapter that I was asked to quite write quite recently. I was asked to do the education policy chapter for a book that's about to come out on Harold Wilson. And so kind of some of the trigger to all this kind of thinking was his, you know, his white heater technology speech. And so it sort of shaped my thinking in terms of situating some of those debates and you know, comprehensive schooling to some extent, I mean, Wilson, we kind of come back on that in a moment, but Wilson, um, you know, that the ideal of the comprehensive school was part of this vision of a new Britain. So, um, kind of those things, and some of those themes, not articulated in that way, but for some of the people who I spoke to who were reflecting on their experiences of comprehensive education at this point as a pupil, did the word modern was used. So I kind of, that, that was quite interesting. Another phrase um, that I've been reflecting on that came through some of the interviews was the notion of other people's children. That if we think about secondary modern schools, these were not children, that schools that would be attended by our children, if we're thinking about politicians and policy makers. These were schools for, the other in some kind of way. And one of the things that I um, think is very powerful for Caroline is that, you know, she's campaigning on the, she sends her children to a comprehensive school, but she's also obviously campaigning on behalf of other people's children. And in fact, although I don't think Melissa uses this language, it's kind of embedded within one of the quotes that's made in the tribute to Caroline, reflecting on the influence that her mother had. So, my other theme is kind of wanting to reflect on Caroline's multiple identities in thinking about identity politics in everyday life. So although I am going to take a chronological approach, as I go through, I, I will be picking up on some of those identities. And embedded in the whole and kind of reflecting on that is thinking about wider literature um, uh, about women and education. So some of the quotes that I just do want to share with you as a way of leading into my next section are the three at the very start that I've um, it italicised there. So one person said to me, she, she led a woman's life, very much a woman's life, as well as a political life, if you know what I mean. So I kind of wanted to play on those ideas in terms of thinking about the story that I'm telling today. Another word that was used again and again about Caroline 
was this point about keeping to her principles. So I thought that's just a short nugget there that captures that. But the word integrity, working hard, the way she kept all of these different balls up in the air, as well as spending considerable amount of time with her family, that was a thread that came through multiply. And this point about her being intellectually and politically a woman without doubt. She knew the comprehensive ideal was the right way, and for her the problem was how to get there. So, so um, those kinds of um, expressed differently, of course, but those threads were quite central. So now I am going to kind of provide you and share some sort of vignette, vignettes around Caroline's life and work. Going back to thinking about Caroline growing up in the Midwest in the 1920s. So she comes from an elite background, the daughter of a lawyer, a family that does have its own tradition of involvement in municipal politics and involvement in American Republican politics, going back to her grandfather's involvement in, um, as part of the local Cincinnati political elite. She herself is educated at a boarding school in New England and that milieu is beautifully captured in her novel that's sitting on the table over there. She then goes on to Vassar and graduates and the summer in which she graduates she comes to Britain to attend a summer school at St Hilda's College, Oxford. And it's at that summer school that she meets, through a friend, with Tony Benn. They have a whirlwind courtship. He proposes within nine days of the meeting on the bench that you see them sitting on there, which he subsequently buys from Oxford City Council and is now at Stan's ground house and Caroline and Tony, are, their ashes are in front of it. Um, so this is an absolute love story. You know, I mean, that is um, a central element of it. One thing that I've now seen is the programme for the summer school that she attended and a range of tutors speaking, including Anthony Blunt was one name that stood out. <laughs> Um, John Newsom speaking on the educational system in Britain at that point in time. Tony Crossland was lecturing on um, nationalised industries and pricing policies. Morris Dobb, the communist historian, was another lecturer. So a range, oh, and Joan Robinson was also speaking, social historian and economic historian. She was speaking on Keynesian theory. So a range of very eminent individuals and this event, and one of the things that um, Caroline and Tony attend in that nine days is a, a, a ball. Um, and then that the subsequently, Caroline goes back to America. Tony, at that point, is still stu a student himself. You know, he's had his war service and returned to Oxford after the war. And so he actually graduates. Um, well, completes his final exams just after she's returned to the US. As a result of their courtship, she changes plans and actually does her MA locally at Cincinnati University rather than Vassar. I get the sense that she had possibly been going to go to Vassar, but the plans changed. So she, in order for her to be able to spend time with her family, because they do anticipates an imminent marriage once Tony has completed his own studies and then you know they will marry in the US and return to the UK to set up home. They do have um, shared, you know, obvious sharings in terms of background, one of which would be the nonconformity, if we're thinking about nonconformist you know, links in with religion. That was something that was a, a very important strand in both of their backgrounds. 
to pick up on the love story element, um, and this actually does come through obviously the Dark Tony's own diaries, but they're um, affectionate nicknames for one another. Tony called Caroline Pix or Pixie, and Caroline called Tony Greensleeves. Oh no, he called, yeah, that was his name for. And so sometimes the letters would just have a, a little G. And the reason for, I have said to some people, um, there's, a, there's an extensive correspondence leading up to the marriage. And this image was within, uh, amongst those personal papers. And it's Norman Rockwell, the, cr the prom dress. And Rockwell was an extremely popular American artist. And this was on the front cover of, I think it's the Morning Post, um, on uh, a Saturday in March, and this is just kind of leading up to the wedding. So initially, I must admit, I thought it was like a wedding image, but it's actually called the prom dress. So um, they plan the wedding. The wedding happens in, in Cincinnati, and then they return and settle in London. And 1950s for Caroline is largely um, kind of devoted to motherhood, um, set, you know, becoming a wife, supporting um, Tony in his early political career. You know, he gets a seat at Bristol, wins the seat, and then obviously as we come through the late 50s into the early 60s, the huge struggle over the peerage, and you know, there's testimony to the tremendous support that Caroline offered to him in that struggle in the diaries as well as obviously other personal papers. But meanwhile, she is, especially as we come to the early 60s, um, there's evidence of growing involvement, particularly in campaigns and interest in education. And this is where, um, I'm not going to go into detail now, but thinking about the work of scholars like Miriam David, you know, reflecting on mothers and education. You know, something else that came through both Caroline's life and work, but also, um, again, some of the oral history interviews, was that for women of Caroline's generation and her background, and in that particular space, so the politics of place, as I label them in other things, um, thinking about London, Many of the women in Caroline's milieu, in that kind of context where you've got debate around comprehensive schooling, because it was part of, um, in London, the London County Council actually in the 1940s advocated comprehensive secondary schooling as part of their London school plan. So unlike maybe other parts of the country, it is uh, more to the forefront as something that's been debated from the 40s onwards. But one of the themes that came through a range of individuals that I talked to was that for many of the women who weren't necessarily in paid work, becoming a school governor, becoming active in the school that was going to be attended by their children was a kind of route to, that they took. So Caroline actually was part of a larger milieu in that sense of kind of following that particular pathway at that particular moment in time and in that particular space. You know, and that comes through if you look at who's doing a lot of the work, behind some of the work behind the scenes, but around campaigns associated with what be, Come, some of those kind of high profile early London comprehensive schools, that it was women of a particular social background that were very much organising to turn those schools around. So one of the stories that came through, for instance, in relation to that was actually the story around Islington Green. And some of these women governors, you know, actively being involved in kind of encouraging particular individuals who are sometimes part of their broader social network, you know, why don't you apply for a post there? You know, you're qualified, you could... So, and that was something very much a thread that was coming through and also being active sometimes in the recruitment of head teachers. So that in, in relation to the Islington Green story, that came through in relation to Margaret Maiden, 
for instance. So um, kind of commonalities there in terms of thinking about the journey that's taken. So in the early 1960s, the decision taken by um, Caroline and Tony to send, at that point we're talking about their elder sons, Hilary and Stephen, to Holland Park Comprehensive School. The school that's opened kind of roughly 10 minutes walk away from the home that they're now settled in, which is to be their home for half a century in Holland Park Avenue. And obviously if we're thinking about national politics now as well, we're thinking we're sort of back to Harold Wilson and um, the lead up to the 1964 general election and the inclusion of a pledge to reorganize education along secondary education along comprehensive lines kind of galvanizes um, and motivates um, some of this additional campaigning and in the wake of the um, Labour Party victory and in the wake of the publication of Circular 1065, that autumn you get the establishment of the Comprehensive Schools Committee that is Caroline is central to. And one of the threads that came through every single interview Obviously, some people were talking about different elements of Caroline's life, but those who are speaking to this particular period and this particular moment in time, stressing her centrality in the campaigns um, and the, 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 um, the, the mobilizing of that um, committee. And some of the quotes, I have captured some of those um, within the handout that you've got. Uh, some of them very, very evocative of the meetings that took place at Caroline and Tony's house in Holland Park Avenue. And that wasn't just coming through the meetings that took place there in relation to the Comprehensive Schools Committee. That came through for a number of the other groups that Caroline was associated with. Um, but very warm memories and a, a lovely evocative one somebody's saying here I can see the house very clearly in my mind and a wonderful description of how you went through and how some of the meetings some of the meetings were held in the Ben's sitting room and other times during the day time um, Car uh, Tony had a basement office and the office was the hive of activity around the production of the kind of research that fed into those annual surveys. So Clyde, in, his, in sharing his memories, spoke to um, certain days of the week when you know, he'd finished, he's, he's a teacher at this point in time, finished his teaching, he would go along and join Caroline and really help her with the correspondence. I mean, it's interesting thinking about how campaigns are conducted now, but you know, we speak in the 60s, you know, huge, quantities of correspondence that's coming in from people all you know throughout both internationally but mainly if we're speaking about you know the United Kingdom talking about you know the state of progress in relation to the comprehensive reform in different parts of the country and it's on the basis of that correspondence as well as some of the surveys that she's kind of beginning to amass her detailed knowledge and one of the other points that Clyde reflected on and shared was um, how you know politicians and some of the civil servants in the DES as it then was, you know, would be ringing up and asking Caroline for advice on how a particular authority's planning proposals were going and, and, and she was seen as the person who had that knowledge. So I, I'm now talking, you know, in terms of the period sort of the, the 1964 to 1970 Labour government. Tony writes about this in his diary that the particular hope was attached to Michael Stewart when he was the first education secretary under the Wilson government that Stewart would legislate and if you go uh, in relation to comprehensive education and if you read some of the other uh, diaries and mem political memoirs of the time, that does come through some of the others. Stuart is only at education for a very short while. He loses the argument in Cabinet that legislation should be step number two, but coming in very swiftly after a request. 
um, Harold Wilson does intervene, um, and so the vote is lost. And Crossland very much goes with the kind of cons the uh, the argument that there's this kind of groundswell around the comprehensive reform, so the circular will be sufficient. You know, kind of paraphrasing and simplifying, simplifying there. But one of the things that Caroline was very clear on from the outset, and one of the things that was central to the committee's campaigning, was that she thought that that was a mistake, and from the outset did think that there should have been legislation. 